Welcome back. In this video, I want to talk a little bit about troubleshooting air conditioning in cooler weather. Yeah, temperatures matter when you're diagnosing air conditioning systems. I recently got a call from a graduate, actually an email, wondering why a service manager was upset at him for constantly misdiagnosing refrigeration leaks and low charge systems. Well, he was actually more curious about what he's missing because he's putting his gauges on, he's seeing low charge systems, and he's immediately thinking low charge, add refrigerant, or there's a leak in a system. So I would lost track of this graduate for a while, and I found out that he was working in the Chicago area, and the problems began sometime in October. So the real question is, does cold weather matter when diagnosing an air conditioning system? There's another question as well. Why do people run their air conditioning in colder weather? Well, there's a number of reasons. There's a lot of buildings that hold heat. For example, condos and apartment buildings hold a lot of heat. The sunlight can beat on part of those buildings, especially if there's large windows, and those buildings can actually heat up on a very, very cold day. Hospitals and other settings where people are on oxygen. Years ago, I serviced a nursing facility, skilled nursing care, nursing home, um, elderly care, where people are on oxygen. People who are on oxygen have a tendency to feel colder or warmer all the time than people who are not. It doesn't matter what the outside temperature is, it matters what they're feeling. Commercial buildings with equipment loads like copiers, computers, fluorescent lighting, all of this stuff makes you have to air condition. And of course, we can't forget about process cooling where we're having to use air conditioning to cool off products as they come off an assembly line. But we're not going to worry about that much in this video because those that's a different part of the trade almost. But let's talk about what we call comfort cooling, true air conditioning. We have to do a little bit of review for those who haven't dealt with this much, but it's always good to step back a little bit. We know that there's a temperature pressure relationship. As the temperature increases, so does the pressure. As the temperature decreases, so does the pressure. Every substance has a slightly different temperature pressure relationship. We also know that every liquid has a boiling point. Water, for example, boils at 212 degrees. This is all in Fahrenheit. I'm not doing Celsius in this video. And in reverse, every gas has a condensing point. Water condenses at 212 degrees. Okay, this conversion between liquid and gas is known as a change in state. Every liquid also has a freezing point. The freezing point is where liquid becomes a solid. The freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Something I else also didn't put on this slide is we know that air contains moisture. Even in the Sahara Desert, air contains moisture. So air has a condensing point, okay, and air has a freezing point because of the moisture in that air. Also, there's other gases, for example, air contains oxygen, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, sometimes carbon dioxide more often, okay, and all those components have different temperature pressure relationships. Now, why is this important? Because refrigerant, what makes our systems get cold and warm and moves heat has a temperature pressure relationship. We also have to know, remember the heat movement. Heat will always naturally move from an area of high temp to an area of low temp. If water is at a temperature of 200 degrees and the room is at a temperature of 75 degrees, water will reject heat into the room. If water is at a temperature of 40 degrees and the room is at a temperature of 75 degrees, water will absorb heat from the room. If you remove that water, the room has slightly less heat because we've taken that heat that was absorbed out of the room. The greater this temperature difference, the faster the rejection or absorption takes place. There are four major parts of the refrigeration portion of air conditioning system. We have the compressor. It's a vapor pump. It increases the pressure of refrigerant. Okay, and compressors cannot pump liquid. This is a very important fact. 
You cannot compress a liquid. If you try to compress a liquid in a compressor, the metal components will actually snap and break. So the temperature of the refrigerant coming into the compressor must be over the boiling point of the liquid refrigerant when it gets to the compressor. The refrigerant cannot be in a liquid form. It takes low pressure vapor refrigerant from the suction line and discharges it at a high pressure vapor into the discharge line going to the condenser. The next component is the condenser. It is the outside coil. I'll show you some pictures of this in a minute. It takes the vapor refrigerant from the discharge line at a temperature greater than the outside air temperature, otherwise known as ambient air temperature, and allows the refrigerant to cool as it rejects the heat to the outside air. As the vapor refrigerant reaches its condensing point, it changes state to a liquid. It continues to cool as it leaves the condenser in the liquid line. Okay, here's just a couple pictures. We have our, this is a residential HVAC unit. We have our compressor that's sitting inside the whole condensing unit, this coil around this compressor. The coil with the fins you can see is the condensing coil. The next component is the metering device. It's like putting the finger your finger over the end of a garden hose. The high pressure water from the hose sprays out through the gap your finger leaves and is a lower pressure as it sprays out. The same in an air conditioning system. The metering device takes a, the high pressure liquid refrigerant from the liquid line and sprays it into the next component, the evaporator, and it's at a much lower pressure. The evaporator is also known as the indoor coil. The metering device sprays across the low pressure refrigerant into it. It absorbs heat from the air blowing across the coil, and the temperature of the refrigerant rises above the boiling point. It takes that heat with it out of the space back to the compressor, and the cycle starts all over. So again, Here's a picture on the left of an evaporator coil in an air handler. Air comes in through the bottom, gets sucked through the coil by the blower motor, which is a, the, right above it, the spot with the rest mark on it. And this coil is just a series of tubes. The thicker line coming in here is the um, suction line, and the small copper line is the liquid line. On here on the left is the metering device, and you can see how this works. It partially blocks the flow of refrigerant going into the evaporator coil, and it only allows through that little hole in the center the refrigerant to flow into the coil. Therefore, it causes a pressure drop. So the refrigerant cycle breaks down to a couple easy steps. The compressor takes the low pressure vapor refrigerant from the suction line connected to the evaporator and compresses it to a high pressure refrigerant and pushes it through the discharge line into the condenser. The condenser allows air to come in contact with the tubes containing this high pressure, high temperature refrigerant and heat is rejected into the cooler outside air through the metal of the tubes. Once the refrigerant temperature drops, it will reach its condensing point and become a liquid. So again, we have our compressor in the center here our refrigerant leaves through the discharge line. Okay, we have our compressor. Our refrigerant comes through the discharge line. It's a vapor still. It comes into the condenser. And as this refrigerant moves through the condenser, it cools down to it's no longer a vapor. It is now liquid. It then moves out of the condenser and it moves to my next component, which is the metering device. The refrigerant then leaves the condenser as a high pressure liquid and travels through the liquid line to the metering device. The metering device takes this liquid refrigerant and sprays it into the evaporator through a tiny hole or orifice. This drops the pressure of the refrigerant. The boiling point of the low pressure refrigerant is now below the temperature of the surrounding room or air in the ductwork. And the refrigerant will absorb heat, boil, and change back to a vapor. 
the vapor refrigerant leaves the evaporator back to the compressor through the suction line as a low temperature, low pressure vapor. So again, we have our metering device. Okay, we have our metering device. Right here. And the liquid refrigerant comes in here as a high pressure, but then as it sprays out, it's now a low pressure liquid. As this low pressure liquid begins to absorb heat, it will begin to boil off. Okay, and as it boils off, it's going to change into a vapor. And then it leaves the evaporator as a high pressure vapor. or as a low pressure vapor and comes back to the compressor where the cycle starts all over again. Now, the evaporator also condenses water on the outside of the tubes. Think about putting a cold glass of ice water on a table in a warm room. The humidity from that room will condense on the outside of the glass and cause a puddle on the table. The water condenses onto the outside of the evaporator coil, dehumidifies the air in the building, and must be able to drain away. Remember, water freezes at 32 degrees. The refrigeration system is a sealed system. Refrigerant will go through the refrigerant cycle forever, and it will continue to do so. It's never used up, it's never destroyed, and it will never go away unless there's a leak. The rules apply to 95% of all commercial and residential air conditioning systems. I'm sure somebody listening to this is going to find and remind me of an exception. There are some out there, but this is for the majority. The evaporator temperature, that's the boiling point of the refrigerant in the evaporator, cannot go below 32 degrees because the coil cannot freeze the water on the outside of the coil. The evaporator temperature must always be cooler than the room temperature. The condenser temperature must always be above the ambient or outdoor air temperature. Here are some a few guidelines that will help. The temperature difference of the air blowing across the evaporator should be someplace between 15 and 20 degrees. The higher the humidity, the lower the temperature difference. The lower the humidity, the higher the temperature difference. Humidity causes a big load on air conditioning systems. So the temperature difference, take your return air temperature at the return air grill or the filter or in the return air line and your supply air temperature as it leaves the coil. The condensing temperature of the refrigerant, that's the point where the refrigerant changes back to a liquid in the condenser should be about 30 to 35 degrees above the ambient air temperature for older systems and about 10 to 15 degrees above the ambient temperatures for the newer highly efficient equipment. That's because they've made the coils quite a bit larger on the newer systems and there's way more surface area to have the temper to have the heat rejection so the air temperature the condensing temperature drops a little bit. So let's get back to our original question. Does cold weather matter when diagnosing an air conditioning system? When, at it, when we answer that question, we need to remember the temperature-pressure relationship. The lower the temperature, the lower the pressure. The lower the pressure, the lower the temperature. So let's look at a simple chart. We're only evaluating R22 and R410A as that's 95% of the air conditioning systems currently. Things will change in the future. Okay, so on a 90 degree day, okay, let me throw, I'm going to try to throw some marks on this screen here. Okay, on a 90 degree day, we want our condensing temperature to be about 120 degrees. I'm going with the 30 degrees above. For an R22 system, that means my condensing pressure is 260 PSI. My condensing pressure on a 410A system is 417 PSI. 
I want my evaporator temperature to be about 36 degrees. Remember, I need it to be above freezing, and I need it to be above freezing if there's ever a little bit of a restriction, like as the filter gets dirtier, as before the homeowner or business owner changes the filter. So 36 degrees is a nice safe number. It works out to be an evaporator refrigerant, a boy evaporator pressure of 60 PSI. Okay, for 410A, that's 111 PSI. Now, why am I going through these numbers? Because it gives me a base point before we talk about what happens on a 40 degree day. Okay, so right now, let's go with the perfect system. I have a 90 degree outdoor temperature, 36 degree evaporator, which gives me 120 degrees condensing temperature, which equals a 260 PSI pressure on an R22, or 120 degrees equals 417 on a um, 410A system. Now, remember, refrigerant is never used up. It's a sealed system. Just as easily it's never being used up, refrigerant is not added if the pressure drops. It's a sealed system. If the outdoor temperatures drop, the pressures will drop. If the pressure drops outside, the pressure will also drop inside. This is the key point. If the outdoor temperature drops, the pressure will drop. If the pressure drops outside, the pressure also drops inside. So now let's add my two other columns, okay, for our 40 degree day. Just like I did for the 90 degree day, we're now going to look at R410A and R22. Okay, condensing temperature, 70 degrees, brings me to a 120 PSI condensing pressure and a 202 PSI condensing pressure, again, the two refrigerants. We have an evaporator temperature, 7 degrees, because again, outside pressures have dropped by about 50%. So my inside pressures are going to drop by about 50%. Which when I convert my pressure to temperature, these are the numbers I'm going to get. Does everybody see the problem here? All of a sudden, my evaporator temperature is way below 32 degrees. So my evaporator is going to start freezing up, not to mention the efficiency issues. These are rough numbers in terms of the pressure drops, but this gives you an idea of what can happen. Regardless of the refrigerant, the pressure drops throughout the whole system. The compressor becomes less efficient. The evaporator is under 32 degrees, and the condensate on the outside of it will freeze. Because ice is an insulator, it prevents the heat from being absorbed and will begin to return liquid refrigerant to the compressor and eventually will damage the compressor. It will confuse a technician that does not remember this or does not frequently work in cold environments. The low pressures do not mean the system is undercharged or there's a leak. The system's not going to be cooling properly, but there's most likely nothing wrong with the system. A good technician who's aware of this problem can wrap the condenser in a tarp or a plastic bag, don't put it over the fan, which will help increase the pressures. What you're doing is reducing the airflow. Watch your gauges and simulate the pressures you'd find on a 90 degree day. In other words, you want to bring your gauge pressure up to that 417 PSI for an R22 system or 122 PSI for R22 system. And that will bring your pressures throughout your system up to what you would find on a 90 degree day. You can also install a fan cycling control that turns on and off or just the speeds of the outdoor fan based on the high pressure side of the system. You can realize that you cannot diagnose the refrigerant pressures and do not make diagnoses of pressures, leaks, etc. if the outdoor temperatures are too low. It is perfectly okay to tell a customer, hey, this is, I'm going to throw in a fan cycling control, but we're going to have to come back when the temperatures are warmer to properly diagnose this system. A confused technician 
or a technician that doesn't understand this will diagnose a cold system on a day and tell their customer, hey, it's undercharged, it's leaking, or it's no longer efficient and has compressor issues. Okay, so all of this is things that I hear from people diagnosing systems on cold days. Some final notes to throw in here. It's important to realize that cold outdoor ambient temperatures require special handling of air conditioning diagnostics. It's okay to temporarily block outdoor airflow across a coil to raise the pressures. It's highly recommended that any time you charge or add refrigerant to a system at cold ambient temperatures, you visit that system and recheck it on the first available warm day. So back to our my question from my email from a former graduate okay it's just important to remember that cold temperatures will affect the pressures throughout the entire system and can easily replicate what you would be seeing with an undercharged or a leaking system your pressures throughout the entire system will be low and the refrigeration system will not be effective so for those of you who are aces in the trade work in the trade sorry about the little bit of review at the beginning but there are newer people to the trade that do watch these videos and i needed to review the refrigeration cycle so again cold pressure cold temperatures matter they will drop the pressures throughout the entire system and mess up your diagnostics